Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thank you so much for investing your time to be with us today. I am Pamela Yunis Ahire, a policy officer in the Trade Investment and Finance Unit of the European Center for Development Policy Management, ECDPM. I'll be the moderator for today, and I am uniquely privileged to welcome you to this webinar that will involve a panel of notable speakers who will explore how COVID-19 is boosting financial inclusion. This year's webinar series started in May with one on agri-finance, and we will have another on COVID-19 recovery in fragile and conflict-affected countries on June 30th. Today, we will focus on COVID-19 and digital financial inclusion, an issue that is related to agri-finance and conflict-affected communities as well. COVID-19 can be a game changer in boosting digital financial inclusion for all. It holds the potential to make tremendous transition from the use of fiat money to adoption of digital financial systems such as mobile money, online banking, and other fintech applications, even among the most vulnerable communities. At the start of the pandemic, most countries embraced digital financial policies to combat the spread of COVID-19. This effectively facilitated financial transactions amid the new normal that involved lockdowns and social distancing. At the same time, the pandemic has threatened many years of economic empowerment, disrupting digital financial inclusion projects, weakening the abilities of people to earn and use such services. In, in this webinar, we will discuss how COVID-19 pandemic has affected digital financial inclusion and how it presents opportunities to boost it. Before I introduce our distinguished speakers, let me first provide you with the logistical information. We will maintain only the videos of the panelists, so we kindly request you to switch off your cameras and please mute yourself so that we all can have a good sound stream throughout the webinar. We will also be taking questions throughout the session, so feel free to post them at any time in the chat function and in the Q and A function. This webinar is intended to be a discussion, so there will be no PowerPoint presentations at all. We will have an interactive discussion among our guest speakers who will be answering questions at any time from our participants. Now, I'm excited to introduce you our panel guests from the public sector, private sector, financiers, and entrepreneurship experts who have done remarkable work in the area of digital financial inclusion. I'll start off with Fiona Shera. Fiona has more than 15 years of experience in international development, and she's currently a technical director of the Arab Women's Enterprise Fund. She has worked on different projects in Egypt, Jordan, and also Mexico that have boosted financial inclusion. Fiona will be bringing in a perspective from the field where digital financial projects have been implemented and results have been realized. We also have Paula Chevo. Paula has many years of experience in research, technology, innovation, and development. She's currently the coordinator of the African Union, European Union Digital for Development Hub at Enable that aims at ensuring digital transformation efforts that can also cross the digital divide. Paula will bring in a perspective from the international policy space where EU and AU interact to make policies that can boost digital financial inclusion. Our third uh, guest speaker is William Edwards Cook. William has a very rich experience in digital financial services. He's currently a senior financial expert at the consultative, consultative group to assist the pool, CIGAP, and has uh, published intensive research on financial inclusion, payment systems, interoperability, digital governance, among many others. William will bring in a perspective from the technical sector where he has worked on payment services, interoperability directly. Finally, we have Bitangen Demo, a professor of entrepreneurship at the University of Nairobi, Kenya, in Kenya. 
He is also the immediate former permanent secretary of Kenya uh, of Kenya's Ministry of Information and Communication, an award winner of the prestigious presidential chief of the Burning Spear of Kenya for his distinguished services and is highly credited for the transformation of the Kenya ICT sector. Professor Ndemo will bring in a perspective from the public sector of developing countries and from also his intensive experience, he will also bring in lessons he has learned over time from his position as a permanent uh, secretary. Now, uh, let's start with William Edwards Cook. Uh, given that uh, digitalization has enabled developing countries to provide sophisticated financial services like digital lending and insurance services, and this is well confirmed uh, in the recent Digital Financial Inclusion Index by the IA, uh, IMF, which shows that fintech is a key driver of financial inclusion in Africa, Asia, and uh, Pacific regions. Uh, specifically, I was reading through some of your research and you emphasized that the biggest challenge in scaling effective financial infrastructures that work for the poor people go beyond technology itself to cover questions of ownership, governance, economics, regulations, and even political economy. Given all these factors, how, how has the pandemic uh, affected this progress? Can you give us examples and in what countries where uh, this progress has been uh, highly affected, positively or negatively? Thank you. Over to you, uh, William. You take a market like Pakistan, where mobile financial products were available, but perhaps underutilized uh, but before the crisis. And you've seen almost a doubling in, in number of active account holders uh, in that market. If you look at other markets like uh, Kenya that had already reached saturation, then, then you see more of a plateau um, in, in growth there. If you turn to use, and kind of what I would separate as a set of bucket here, there's been more universally a deepening of how these services are being used. Um, so CGAP studies of uh, markets like Philippines and Colombia have showed, uh, you know, an increased reliance in informal commerce. Um, GSMA data similarly shows, you know, 10 to 20 percent increase in digital transactions uh, across mar uh, mobile money markets. Uh, so, so clearly an increase in use amongst those who are already using these services and they're, and they're using it differently, right? Um, so this is a, partly a factor of uh, lockdowns and, and this sort of thing, but fewer proximity payments, uh, more FinTech, uh, more remote payments. The, the other uh, thing that I would mention before passing it, it over here is on uh, governments and, and social protection payments. That's the other big trend uh, that we saw during COVID is the expanded use of, of social protection, trans cash transfers for emergency relief. And, and similar to the access story, you know, uh, this was largely a story of where markets started dictating where they ended. Uh, so if I think of a market like India where NPCI and Aadhaar based accounts were used for COVID payments, you had $9 billion going to 420 million people uh, using accounts, you know, targeting specifically uh, subgroups like farmers, construction, uh, construction workers, elderly. And, you know, really probably the most remarkable thing about all of that was that it was pretty unremarkable in, in the India context. Those rails were already there. They had already been used by other forms of GDP disbursement over the, over the previous years. Similar sort of story in a market like Jordan, where a national aid fund um, enabled by Joe Pack and the Jomo Pay infrastructure uh, led to half a million new mobile money accounts uh, to receive these aid payments. Um, but then the flip side of that is a lot of markets where these tools weren't available, where you know digital ID, interoperable payments hadn't already taken hold, uh, struggled to, to move these payments out the door in, in a timely way, you know, often resorting to these sort of legacy approaches, uh, physical cash disbursement and these sort of things that we've seen in previous years. I'll leave it there. Thank you so much, uh, William. You, you mentioned about Pakistan and Kenya. 
how has COVID-19 uniquely affected them given the payment rates, which I think may differ depending on country? Do you see any disparities in that case? Like I was saying, I, I think it's a largely a story of, of, you know, where you started dictating a bit of where you end. So, uh, yeah, I think numbers from Kenya have actually show in GSMA data shows fairly moderate change in behaviors in a market like Kenya, where uh, M-Pesa had really taken hold on, on a national level and, and was pretty ubiquitous already. In a market like Pakistan, it was more radical change. I, I think the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, you take a market like uh, Nigeria where mobile money services haven't really taken hold and you actually saw a slight uh, backslide. Um, I think GSMA was saying 11% uh, pre-crisis to 9% of people having uh, the, the, using those services today. Uh, thank you so much, uh, William. And now let's also move to Professor uh, Ntemo, uh, who also will be discussing uh, cases of Kenya, including other countries. Uh, Bitange, uh, in your book, which is the Digital uh, Kenya, you mentioned that uh, digital revolution has emerged in Africa, disrupting old players around all circles. Then, the COVID-19 pandemic occurs, which makes uh, this re revolution uh, uh, stand tested. Though it is, re it has been repeatedly been said that uh, Africa has acted decisively in combating the pandemic. Some of these decisions have come at a very uh, costly trade uh, offs, as William has already mentioned that a lot of COVID has disrupted some of the uh, programs in place. What are some of the policy initiatives that have been embraced on ground and how have these boosted or to some extent limited digital financial inclusion in these countries? Over to you, Professor. Yes, um, a lot of things have happened. Uh, and what happened is, uh, like uh, has been said before, that uh, Kenya had reached almost a saturation point with respect to digital money. But new forms of uh, digital money through uh, mobile lending and others are now just at their, at their start. And we are seeing a growth in that aspect. But one of the best things that happened immediately they, when we, um, when in March last year, when uh, the entire economy was shut down. Um, the law, those who are at micro enterprise level had a lot of difficulty accessing their customers. And in some cases from the university, we trained a few women on how to leverage or re repurpose WhatsApp, which is a, um, an app for communication to uh, take pictures of their uh, suppliers and then sent to customers. It became very easy because they were able to receive payment and uh, also deliver the goods using the taxi bikes, which which will drop. We we instantly created uh, an e-commerce platform for the law because we had very many forms of digital money. Either they could borrow and they use it for buying the supplies and be able to send it to the customers uh, without moving from their homes. Uh, so you you can see the level of inclusivity by simply having digital payment platforms that uh, work. Mm -hmm. From the policy side, uh, the president actually closed and said everybody should be using uh, M-Pesa, which is the mobile money. And it, there were no complaints. Everybody shifted onto the platform, um, even though everybody actually uses the platform. So we didn't have a lot of problems. But in some other African countries, where the uh, the usage has not been um, extensive as in Kenya, there were a bit of problems. Thank you, uh, Professor. You you mentioned some other countries, and yes, the other countries that have taxed mobile money and also access to digital financial services, this over-the-top tax. How did they uh, 
respond to such uh, taxation policies during the pandemic? Did they try to limit them to allow people if, to effectively use these services? Actually, there were other general problems like uh, those countries that uh, sometimes close down the internet, uh, they completely undermine um, the citizens. Um, and that's what I worry more. The taxes is just additional costs, but it, it is a problem also because this is now a service that is used by the very poor that uh, we should avoid taxation of either broadband or taxation of mobile money uh, when it is, uh, uh, when everybody knows that it affects the, the poor more than, than, than the rich people. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned about uh, the divide in, in the digital sector. And let's also move to Paula, who has worked on such uh, policies that intend to cross the digital uh, divide gap. The pandemic has indeed exposed the great digital divide that exists between developed and developing countries, and also within the different countries. What new dynamics are being embraced in the international digital ecosystems towards promoting digital financial inclusion for all? Over to you, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, Pamela, for you, these very interesting questions. Um, well, yes, uh, as we said uh, already, despite the benefits that of expanding digital financial services, uh, still unequal access to technology and digital services can exclude people, uh, people living in, uh, in remote areas, in rural areas, and also other categories of the population, such as people with disabilities, uh, women, and, and youth. And even though this is not only, um, it's not one of the only barriers, access to infrastructure and technologies still play a key role in, into this problem. Um, let me mention that, um, for example, in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, those are the countries that are among those with the lowest access to the internet, despite being the world leaders in mobile money transactions. Uh, in the same region, if we look at uh, uh, internet connectivity by firms, there is a large disparity with only about 60% of businesses uh, using emails compared to 85% of businesses using emails in Europe and, and Central Asia. Uh, so um, this is uh, an important challenge and there is no quick fix, uh, but at the same time, uh, innovative solutions are coming up to creatively address uh, problems associated with, with local market conditions. Uh, let, let's take the example of, of Ethiopia, where 85% uh, of the population lives in, in rural areas, in remote areas, and where agent banking works uh, very well. With only 22% of the uh, population formally banked, in principle, mobile banking can significantly help with financial inclusion. However, Ethiopia has one of the lowest rates of mobile penetration in the world. Uh, so, um, one of the first mobile uh, money service providers in the country, Amber, has introduced an innovation that allows bank customers to have a mobile account without a mobile phone. Let me explain very briefly how the, uh, the mechanism that they have proposed. They go around the, the low rate of mobile penetration through a so-called PIN card, a personal identification number combined with a beneficiary card. Uh, end users uh, can go to their agent and conduct financial transactions using their PIN card via their agent's mobile phone. And I think that what's interesting is that, is that during the pandemic, Amber uh, has built on its partnership with the Ethiopian Ministry of Finance and with development finance institutions to enable uh, government social and aid payments via the same systems. And um, William briefly touched on that uh, as well early on. And I think that this is an interesting example to illustrate exactly uh, what you uh, call the new dynamics that have been embraced in the digital ecosystem towards leveraging technology for financial inclusion. We can find many examples of how telcos and fintechs, government, startups, um, development organizations are coming together to foster digital inclusiveness. And, and in our perspective, uh, these examples show how uh, reaping the full benefits of digital financial inclusion and digitalization in general requires um, a coherent multi-stakeholder approach in which all actors of the digital ecosystem play uh, to their different strengths, uh, together with national governments, of course, and with the aim of providing uh, interoperable, adaptive and scalable uh, solutions. And of course, um, as we said earlier as well, digital financial inclusion is not only a matter of access, 
uh, connectivity is only one uh, of the starting points, but other factors such as regulations, skills, institutions are equally important to make digital financial services work for everyone. Uh, but let me stop here for the moment, and I'm sure that we can come back to those other points uh, later in our conversation today. Pamela, you are muted. You mentioned very, thank you so much, uh, Paula. You mentioned very, uh, very pertinent issues of digitalization not just being a matter of of, of access also infrastructure is is important and being able to to have a phone also doesn't really exclude uh exclude or include someone from having access to digital uh, financial services you may not have a phone as you say and then equally have an access to digital services and this can work very well in places where poor people uh, who may not have uh, the financial means to afford a mobile money, and that's a good uh, project going forward. Uh, Willie, maybe because you've worked on the infrastructure, uh, financial infrastructure for, for long, do you think that uh, such uh, inability to have a mobile phone in, in such instances may create such a, a great change and what could be the limitations? that may be involved in such a case. And maybe I would also like to uh, remind our participants that you can post any questions at, at any time. Feel free to, to post in the chat function, also in the Q&A function. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, the mobile phone does seem to be the primary channel that we're seeing used today. I mean, uh, fortunately, in, in that it's it's fairly ubiquitous, but, but unfortunately, as folks have been saying that, you know, increasing focus on mobile as a channel, whether that's app or USSD uh, does present this sort of exclusion uh, potential or factor for, for those without that technology. There are, there are still things available there. So you look at a market like India with, with biometric uh, withdrawal, you know, AEPS, Aadhaar based accounts or uh, more legacy card approaches. But, but I think as mobile takes uh, greater and greater hold of, of these solutions, you know, th there's uh, an increasing focus there. Thank you so much, uh, William, for that. In the chat, uh, Paula, someone is requesting if you uh, can give a name of such uh, interesting Ethiopian in initiative. Thank you. I'll do so in the chat, no problem. Okay. Uh, so let's also move on to our next uh, speaker who has done already practical work as well on ground. Uh, Fiona mm -hmm. is intensively engaged in ensuring digital financial inclusion in different countries. Can you tell us more about the projects that you've already implemented and also how has uh, the pandemic affected the operations on ground? Yes. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, it's very interesting hearing to the other speakers because a lot of the things they say resonate with some of the things that we have worked on and the Arab Women's Enterprise Fund. Um, this is this is a really unusual program. It's um, very much focused on women and inclusion and empowering women, but working through the private sector. So. Uh, developing models, it's called a market systems approach, you're developing models and innovations that can be tested with private sector partners and, and then pushed out across the, the market. And it was really interesting that financial inclusion actually wasn't immediately a priority under AWEF, but it became very clear that as we work with other bits, other sectors, other parts of uh, market systems, that the, the access to finance, women's access to finance was a major constraint on growing their businesses, on, on their own personal control over their financial situation as well. And so this is what led us into working on digital financial inclusion in both specifically Jordan and Egypt. Um, and what I wanted to highlight really was some of the key features of these projects and learnings, which I think is really relevant for others entering this sector. So one of them is that women are a very, very different kind of customer um, and inclusion. When you're looking at building financial inclusion into digital systems, you have to really think about the products, 
and the way that services are provided and how it may need to differ for women as a, as a particular market segment. So one of our learnings was that women don't tend to trust new technology. They might be wary about using technology. And we introduced an agent model in both Jordan and in Egypt, which provided a very different way of distributing these services. Women often in running small businesses were involved with selling the EE wallets, which was the principal product that we focused on in our F initially. And they also were trained in a way that they could encourage women uh, to learn how to use them um, and to, to, to look at the services and how they would be useful for them as individuals or their businesses. So I think that's one key learning. The other key learning that we had around how to do uh, financial inclusion, again, with a focus on women, but it goes beyond this, is that often women lack the, the financial literacy, digital financial literacy skills. So one of the other interventions that we worked on was very much focused on combining financial services, um, digital financial services, micro lending services, and also learning, um, which was also provided digitally. So helping women to access tools that help them to understand how to use the product, um, what the value of them was, um, you know, how to deal with questions. And, and challenges that they might have as, as sort of first time digital users. And this is actually in Egypt now. Um, we're working with the Financial Regulatory Authority in Egypt to roll out this blended with this, this DFS learning approach uh, to lots of different microfinance institutions, uh, micro lending institutions across Egypt. So the idea is that a small, uh, an entrepreneur will, will get a loan through a, a microfinance organization, but will also pre pre receive some coaching and training and support around how to use digital financial services, the way to, to grow their business, to make payments, to improve essentially the value of their loan. And it, it's a real win-win where we've got this uh, helping women to grow their businesses, getting access to finance and getting access to learning. I could talk a whole lot more, but I will leave it there and, and happy to answer further questions. Thank you so, so much, uh, Fiona. Um, I'm very curious about the blended learning and the female agents models that you are uh, trying to uh, employ to ensure digital financial inclusion uh, for all. You mentioned of how women do not trust uh, certain financial systems because of reasons, uh, because they cannot say touch money and maybe they cannot see it, uh, unlike cash, which they can touch and see. How have you tried to uh, address such trust issues to ensure even self uh, and secure use of financial services? Yeah, I mean, this has very, been very much around the distribution model that's been used, the agent model, which was also mentioned by some of the other speakers. And I think that what we learned very uh, early on was that um, a lot of the agents that were used initially by our lead partners, Dinarek in, in Jordan and um, Fauri in, in Egypt, were men. Um, and so a key thing was actually to recruit and train female agents. Um, and often in, it, the, the model has varied according to the different projects. So um, in Jordan, it was actually direct hiring of agents. Um, in Egypt, it was working more with micro and small businesses that were run by women um, and helping those women to learn how to sell the e-wallets into the community. Now, this is really important because I think uh, as anyone who's worked on projects around how to reach women, often women are much more trusting of women than they may be. And we're also talking about environments where social norms may actually work against women engaging very actively with men um, in, in the Middle East, uh, the MENA context. So what this did was sort of completely change the dynamic. What was also done was having very, and this was learned from the initial pilot that was done, was that the, these women needed training, not just in how to sell an e-wallet, but also how to coach uh, women, how to teach them about the benefits of, um, of the digital technology and the digital services. And equally, there was a great deal of learning went on in our partner organizations about how to market. 
um, and the kinds of uh, how to simplify things, how to make things easier to use. So there was there's also been a shift in the marketing strategies that have been used by the um, digital financial service providers. And we've also seen changes in products. So one of the other points that I wanted to mention that I think is a really key important thing to think about for anyone working in this area is that often there's very limited data about the users um, of CFS um, and particularly around the level of inclusion. So, for example, in, in Jordan, we actually work with JOPAC to do some research to look at what women's uh, preferences were, how they used digital financial services, what they what they expected from them, what they expected from the interface with the service provider as well. Um, and that research is being used to now um, encourage the, the, the DFS service providers to adjust their approaches about how they approach marketing, how they approach distribution, and also looking at these opportunities to build blending learning. So this is all part of the strategy to build trust and to encourage more women to use the, uh, the products and services. Thank you so much. Uh, a bit that uh, in this case, uh, no matter the distribution model you use, social norms are very important to consider, and as well the element that women tend to trust uh, women. Uh, William, you've, you've worked so much in ensuring that you reach a lot of small, medium, and uh, micro enterprises, which typically may involve a lot of women. How have you tried to ensure that women are not excluded in such uh, projects? Yeah, I mean, I, so, so I tend to focus uh, at the payments infrastructure level where, where it tends to be a bit more neutral in its impact. Um, so, so, you know, in terms of ensuring, you know, rails that one provider is able to connect to another uh, uh, effectively, it hasn't uh, honestly had a, a large impact uh, in, in my day to day. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and then we will we'll move back to Bitange. You mentioned about the Internet shutdown. And uh, as also already have been mentioned, policies on ground beyond the building of the financial infrastructures matter a lot. How are countries, or how do you think countries can do better to make sure that the policies they implement work well for all individuals when it comes to digital financial inclusion? I think we need to pray because um, when it comes to politics, and usually, when they shut down the infrastructure, it's something related to political. I mean, if you look at uh, what happened in Cameroon, what happened in Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, Uganda, it emanates from the politics. And uh, otherwise, for most of the time, the internet is up. We don't want to see uh, internet infrastructure to be shut down at the will of somebody. So that is something that, that can be dealt with through AU, for example, and also um, it can't just be dealt by the policymakers within the country because they are the ones who who, who shut down the internet. Um, we need to find other platforms and be able to provide uh, access to everybody. And on, on countries that have adopted mobile money taxes as well as internet taxes how would you advise other countries that are trying to adopt same policies do you think they work better to address the challenges at hand well we are trying um i think uh, most people know um through transform africa the efforts to create a single digital market i think that is the one that would eliminate and i i'm praying that uh, africa free trade area works so that we can have policy at the continental level uh, that we can enforce uh, against those who violate those policies of try of trying to achieve the, the single digital market in africa uh, so we need more and more discussions at the level of african union and the policies at that level because uh, every time there is politics within a country, 
uh, you will see problems with respect to either increasing taxes like Uganda did or social media or access to internet. Uh, so we, we need policies at that level and try to protect um, broadband as a, a human rights issue. I think that probably would work better than each individual country trying to implement their own policies. Thank you so much. Uh, on on transform uh, Africa, a single digital market. This brings me back to Paula, who is working on the mm -hmm. AU Africa relations. Um, how how can uh, the private sector be involved to promote digital financial inclusion? Thank you, thank you, Pamela, for this interesting question. Uh -huh. And uh, let me say that uh, I very much agree with Professor um uh, and demo when he said that uh you know such issues are very importantly addressed at continental level and in an holistic perspective where it's several dimensions including uh, data privacy cyber security uh, fair competition uh, competitions and, and infrastructures can be uh, tackled together by, by different stakeholders uh, to come back to your uh, questions uh, yes indeed the work that we are doing uh, with the digital for development hub goes exactly in the direction of asking ourselves the questions of how we can work better with all the stakeholders the key players of the digital uh, ecosystems in, a, in, a, in partner countries and in particular in Africa and that of course uh, this is where the, the private sector uh, can play a, a crucial role and they can play a crucial role in, in addressing uh, not only the consequences of, of the pandemic but also in building forward better um, and that's the reason uh, why uh, we believe in this in the potential of this uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations and, and engagement uh, what we're doing is uh, we are engaging with, with private sector partners that are um, committed already uh, to, to promote uh, an inclusive, sustainable and secure uh, human centric digital transformation. It's about really uh, having uh, uh, some uh, agreement about the values that uh, want to be also promote in terms of, of digital transformation, having a value based approach to digital transformation and, and, and find, uh, as I was saying before, playing on each other's strengths for now we can contribute uh, to to that to that effort um, and and the idea is really to uh, to to look at if together we can build strategic alliances between different type of actors such as uh, we are definitely uh, you know the, the large high-tech companies but also micro small and medium enterprises as well as civil society organizations and and governments to accelerate and, and scale up um, sustainable digital solutions okay can I just add to that Pamela yeah, I mean, I, I really agree with this point of the multi-stakeholder approach. This is something that we've really seen evolve also within the Arab Women's Enterprise Fund projects. Whilst the focus initially was uh, working with a particular private sector firm to demonstrate the, the kind of business case for change about doing things differently, in this case, uh, building women more into the, the market segment, what it's shown us is that that can kind of begin to escalate into very different kinds of interactions and relationships with different parts of the DFS ecosystem. So I cited the work that we that we did also in Jordan, work, working with JOPAC around the research, um, working with the Financial Regulatory Authority around promoting the idea of blending learning, combining with um, uh, combining with my, micro lending. And, and we've also just seen the, the importance of some of this kind of wider uh, understanding of what the, what the market potential is that needs, that needs kind of leadership from government um, and good regulation in order for the private sector to, and, and, and kind of encouragement for the private sector to do things differently. And this is this, this dynamic and finding ways, I think is a really interesting challenge to to look at the examples of where that kind of building platforms that work across the ecosystem have worked really well, because it seems to me absolutely essential. Inclusion can otherwise just fall by the wayside in the kind of rush to build a, a, a digital financial architecture. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona. William, what do you think of those uh, different points mentioned? I'm sorry, say again? Can what? you reframe the question? 
what do you think of the uh, different approaches, the mark stakeholder approach and the working together as Paula has mentioned and, and the examples that uh, Fiona has already mentioned, how they have cooperated with different sectors to do the branded learning model. Uh, in your experience, how, how do you think the private sector can also be uh, involved to promote financial inclusion or what examples in which you've had to engage the private sector? Yeah, I mean, I, I think ultimately, you know, it, it's it's all about the private sector because they're the ones that are going to be out there, you know, onboarding new, new you know, clients. And I think sometimes even we lose track of that a bit too much in terms of, um, you know, a focus on uh, being able to build, you know, uh, sustainable business models. You know, some of the policies uh, pursued during COVID, you know, I think were great as temporary measures in terms of, uh, you know, wiping out fees for for a short term and this sort of thing. But we've seen negative impacts uh, potentially in the medium term where um, just thinking of Pakistan as an example where uh, the mobile money providers today are quite concerned about their uh, having a business case going forward um, as fee prohibitions continue on and and they see workarounds for things like agent transactions where they're losing revenue. Mm. Thank you so much. Fiona, uh, on the business. Yeah, I, I would also support that. I mean, a key uh, proposition behind our, our, our approach was to make the business case and it has to be strong and it has to be scalable across the market. And um, I think that there's things that governments can do to facilitate, but actually it needs to be a good business proposition. And, and, and what's often needed is to show that and to showcase that. Again, I think um, there's quite li limited evidence on this in terms of making the business case. It's something we, we, we've we actually produced a, a learning brief on making the business case more generally around women's economic empowerment, which is the key premise of the AWEP approach. Um, but there, there, there's a lot of information on, on the business case for inclusion in developed countries, much less so in developing countries. And I think it's something where as, as, as organizations, we could be doing more to get more out there you know about why this makes business sense um and 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 what kind of roles there are for the different stakeholders in facilitating um digital financial inclusion rather than distorting it professor demo any comments on that I think he's muted. So we will go ahead with uh, Paula or, and Fiona and William. Uh, if um, professor, professor manages to be on mute, he can contribute. <laughs> I wondered, Pamela, whether it'd be worth me just being able to mention a couple of things around COVID, which I don't think I really picked up particularly yeah, sure. in the um, in in the initial feedback. I mean, we've seen in, in, in the work in Egypt and Jordan quite a lot of um, sort of pivots and shifts around yes. COVID. You know, some are, some are, have been very positive and some but have been yeah, but I will, I'll let Bitanga speak if he's, he's now unmuted and then you can maybe come back to me later. Okay. Uh Professor, I think if you can hear us, uh, I see he's still uh, unmuted. But maybe you continue if it's possible to hear him, then we can go on. Yep. Okay, I'll carry on, but then very happy to hand over to, to Vitanga. I mean, just a few things that I'd mention is that obviously COVID has faced, created some very practical challenges around scaling financial inclusion in, in, in terms of some of our models. So things like having to, how do you train and onboard new agents? We've had to uh, do some new in innovations and actually onboard people remotely. Um, it, some of the really positive things that I think have happened have been the trends that were, were also mentioned earlier in, in the discussion around uh, use of social transfers. So actually using digital technology to encourage uh, payments and use of social transfers and in, in in both Egypt and Jordan the partners that we worked in so I think somebody actually did specifically mention the um, aid fund in Jordan so Denarek who was one of the agent uh, one of the companies that we work with very closely in Jordan 
was actually work very closely with the National Aid Fund to help with setting up the e-wallets and the payment system in such a way that it, it was possible to make the aid payment. So I think what, what a key learning for, for us was we, we had worked on this financial inclusion piece before COVID. What it did was provide the, the groundwork, the framework, the foundation, which then meant that there was capacity for uh, the digital financial you know, explosion to some extent that has happened, but also that it was inclusive because we had already been working with uh, the sectors and the partners. And I think the other thing I would mention that's been a really interesting development in terms of Egypt uh, is that we've also been doing quite a lot, lot of work on promoting uh, merchants and uses in, of, of mobile um, services to support merchants and e-commerce. And that has also, the, the COVID has really encouraged the shift. We've been working much more proactively with women, um, small businesses, to get them onto e-commerce platforms, to give them the tools, to give them the instruments they need to grow their business. And this has enabled women to keep working at a time when it was very difficult to reach their, reach their customers. So I, I would say there's obviously very significant negatives uh, about the wider impacts of COVID, but in terms of digital financial inclusion, it probably is, uh, has been a positive force for change overall. Uh, Pamela, if I can echo what uh, Fiona just mentioned, and actually also her point from before about um, uh, digital uh, financial uh, capacity and digital uh, financial literacy, which I think is extremely important into uh, the discussion about inclusiveness. Um, we are also uh, seeing uh, quite successful um, success stories in uh, targeting specific uh, categories of the population, such as, uh, as entrepreneurs, and particularly female entrepreneurs. And um, we do so at Annabelle also by supporting the um, startup support structures in, uh, in countries. So we do so, for example, in Benin with the DigiBoost um, uh, project uh, uh, through which um, female entrepreneurs are uh, supported to uh, exactly getting those uh, uh, key skills for them to be able to have uh, the ease and the confidence with the digital financial services. Um, so, and I think that the other uh, key point to consider when we look at uh, digital uh, literacy programs is that, and I think that's a very important point, is that uh, specifically when we uh, use this program to target women, well, it is important to bring women at the core of the very design process of those programs. And I think that's uh, one of the other key success factors that we have been seeing in development projects over the years. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona and, 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 and uh, Paula, about the different uh, practical uh, examples that, you, that you've given us about the e use of the e-wallet, using of promoting of mobile money services in Egypt, and also the startup support. Uh, Professor Ndemo, we were talking about how you could include the private sector in supporting digital financial inclusion to reach uh, the last mile, including people in very remote areas, including women. How has, uh, how can different governments or different um, prayers collaborate with the private sector to ensure that that is achieved? Different governments engage private sector differently. Um, some are embracing public-private partnerships, uh, mainly Kenya, especially in the area of infrastructure development. Uh, others um, have problems with the private sector. Uh, they try to implement projects by themselves, which in most cases fail. Um, the best model that works is where the private sector works very closely with the government um, and uh, government leading with policy implementation. But the confusion at the moment uh, is um, as internet penetrates um, and social media beca becomes a headache, uh, that's where the problem begins because governments try to, um, they're trying to control. If you see what happens in Nigeria, uh, closing down some of the social media uh, platforms. Uh, so we um, we can't tell leaders to be to have thick skin, especially with social media. 
but uh, we need more involvement uh, on the private sector on several aspects, especially uh, if you want to lower the cost, you need many players. You need to have policies that uh, enable interoperability. If you want to have access of infrastructure in places where it cannot make sense, you need to ask the operators to share infrastructure, lower the cost. Uh, so working with the private sector is inevitable because um, there are several things that government must look to in order to seamlessly provide in infrastructure and to provide an environment that works. One area that is creating problems is the transition now into the fourth industrial revolution where politicians are uh, um, propagating uh, or talking about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence, even as we see several benefits of artificial uh, intelligence, they are uh, busy going around that uh, it is going to remove jobs and other things that we are seeing. Uh, this is the same technology we are using in providing uh, financial services without collateral by just using your behavior. Uh, so we, we need to reconcile what the politicians want and what the private sector wants to implement. Um, and that is the difficult part. Um, we need to have a discourse and show the benefits of this emerging tech, uh, which politicians want to undermine that they are going to remove jobs. Right now, I know there are more jobs coming from the digital side than even manufacturing in Africa. In fact, uh, economists are talking about the industrialization of Africa, wondering whether ICTs can take uh, Africa into better development than the traditional model of going through manufacturing and other areas. So there is a lot that is going on in Africa in that space, but in conclusion, I would say it is imperative that every country embraces the private sector to implement um, many of the matching tech issues. Thank you so much uh, for the different points. Uh, how, uh, if the government embraces the public private partnerships, they may attract more players into the market who can then. Uh, lower the costs of accessing the digital financial inclusion. You also mentioned a very important point about using digitalization to create uh, more jobs. And this is the same as Paula and uh, Fiona were also mentioning the importance of the e-commerce. Uh, my other question is, how can the international development institutions, including donors, filtrate the African or even uh, the Caribbean different developing countries markets to support the digital financial inclusion the question is open to whoever may like to answer i'll take a first stab at it um here i mean I, yeah I, and i think it relates to what uh folks have been saying over the past few minutes i'm, I'm really happy to hear all the focus on distribution networks on, on agents merchants because I think a lot of conversation and attention gets paid to, you know, new and shiny things that, that are important, but maybe not the most important. So things like CBDC come to mind, they, they get a lot of attention. And I think we often don't pay enough attention to, you know, th these sort of essential on ramps to formal financial services. You know, what are we actually doing to transition people from uh, the cash economy to, to digital? And I think this relates also to um, some of the remarks made earlier about reduced KYC and remote onboarding uh, taking hold more during COVID. I think in markets like India and Brazil, we're seeing this convergence between the concepts of, of merchant and customer accounts with tiered KYC, merchant payments over P2P, uh, person to person rails, and so forth. And I think the more we start to lower those barriers towards accessing, um, uh, you know, getting on board to financial services, then the better off we'll be. Thank you so much, William. You, you mentioned uh, an important point of 
know your customer. And this has been a very big challenge when it comes to uh, COVID where people who don't have identification documents, uh, for instance, migrants from different countries who didn't have identification documents, they faced a problem transitioning from the cash economy to the digital economy. And, and I have a question, how uh, different uh, prayers, even um, governments involved countries where these are the host communities trying to support uh, such people uh, adopt to the digital financial system. The question is also open to who would like to answer. Uh, Pamela, if I can uh, also uh, give my contribution here, also with regards to your previous point, uh, I think that uh, one of the of the of the key roles that such players can can play is definitely, uh, well, first of all, keep the issue of inclusivity on the agenda, <laughs> because it's not only about uh, market development; it's about uh, inclusive uh, development and sustainable development. And when we talk about inclusiveness, I think it's it's very important to remember that. Um, uh, we cannot really move forward with inclusiveness if we do not look at what we define as the intersectionality of the different um, uh, inequality dimensions. Uh, I think that I mean, if we go back to uh, to, to the focus on on, on women's uh, in in inclusion, for example, I mean, we know that um, digital financial products, uh, inclusive digital financial products, must take account of different uh, needs and contexts and stages of, of women's life, and they may have different effect depending on whether all these different uh, dimensions uh, are taken uh, are taken into account. And then the other point I would also mention is that uh, one of the uh, of the key thing that um, can be done as well by these players is apart from bringing all the different actors around the table to. to to discuss uh, at continental, regional, or national level about how we move forward uh, with those issues is also to, to facilitate the circulation of, of knowledge and best practices. Um, as other speakers mentioned before, uh, there are a lot of uh, interesting examples around. We do not need to, to reinvent the wheel. I mean, there are some more advanced um, examples of uh, digital inclusion and financial inclusions in, in some African countries rather than European countries, for example. So I think that uh, this uh, the advantage of, of knowledge sharing, even uh, you know, looking at technology transfer on mutually agreed term cannot be uh, underestimated. Over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Paula. Uh, the, the, I agree with you that uh, the, the importance of, of the different uh, prayers cannot really be uh, underestimated and ability to facilitate different knowledge, also share practices may be necessary to ensure that uh, some of the projects you've mentioned, for instance, being able to use mobile money, even when you don't have mobile phone, can be replicated in countries where such uh, services uh, are needed. Uh, Fiona, what do you really think about uh, international financial donors, including the uh, financiers who can support financial uh, digital financial inclusion in developing countries, what, in what ways do you think they can come in from your experience in supporting women or even uh, remote areas in Egypt, Jordan, and Mexico? I think you I wasn't unmuted, sorry. Um, I said I think that there'll be a variation in the role of, of or organizations according to you know who they are like it's going to be different for the World Bank or the IFC versus a bilateral donor versus a, um, a, a, a non-governmental organization so each will I think each need to identify their own kind of like where they can potentially add value but I I very agree with um, I strongly agree with Paula about actually one of the key things is to get is to put inclusion on the agenda in and to design projects and approaches around that um, to make sure that it's taken into account. Um, we talk about it in, in the, we did another project at Mexico Financial Services about having the kind of user human focus to the project design. So remembering who is the end user and beginning to design the different levels of your intervention around that according to how it's going to impact on the user, how it's going to, um, what things you need to take into account according to the needs and interests of the user. 
Um, I also agree on the point about sharing learning. And I think actually I've seen that in the chat, we have included um, for AWEF, we did a, uh, a, a learning brief on um, how to, a learning brief based on case studies from AWEF and also from uh, other, other financial inclusion programs about understanding lessons from the field. And I do think that there is a lot out there but it's kind of quite hard to navigate. And, and I don't know whether there's a, a particular donor or a particular lead where coordination on the kind of the learning and the evidence base would, would could could be could be done better so that there we're not reinventing the wheel. I mean, we found this when we started AWEF. We were trying to learn from other projects that had gone on. We looked very closely at the kind of models and the work in Africa and Kenya in particular, because they were kind of seen as the leaders. But in the Middle East, there have really been very little done in this space around uh, around inclusion. So some of it was uh, probably learning things that we could have known already if we had actually had access to better information. So I do think that there's a kind of global public good that uh, the donor and the international community can provide around good practice, but also around encouraging the kind of research I talked about earlier. Um, and then the, the other thing I would add is innovation, really. Um, it's about that, you know, this is going to be specific to the, probably to the donor, to the context of the project. But, you know, what we have done through AWEF is really innovate and experiment and, and try and test different ways of working that work for the particular context that you're in. And every country will be different. Every uh, the, the backdrop, the regulatory framework, the access to the internet, they will all be different. So it does need to be tailored. And, and so I think the biggest thing uh, is to encourage innovation and to test out the things that work in that context um, and working very, very closely with the private sector. Thank you so much, uh, Fiona. Indeed, innovation is very, very important. And, and we have a question in the chat, uh, maybe because uh, it's almost close of the, of, the, of the webinar. So this question can actually act as part of, of our concluding remarks. Uh, uh, Eden is asking, how does the international, how can the international community develop digital services in countries that are uh, uh, are being affected by war, drought, and other environmental hazard, uh, hazards. For instance, uh, in Somalia, you already mentioned about uh, how you've worked in, in the Middle East. I don't know if that has been the same experience, but uh, it would be good to know from all of you as you conclude uh, the, the webinar. Sorry, I didn't, quite, I didn't quite understand the question. Could you just repeat it? How can the international community develop, I think, support digital financial services in war torn countries and countries mm. being affected by climate change? Mm. So, in, in, are there special projects being undertaken in conflict affected countries, or let's say for drought in Mozambique? Was there any special uh, projects? As William also mentioned about the social protection policies that have been embraced during COVID-19, that you can access if you already have uh, digital access to financial services. If you have an account or any other means, the government can reach you to uh, provide such support. So in that instances, I think he may need to know what is what can be done on ground to reach such uh, vulnerable communities. Uh, now that you mentioned uh, Mozambique, um, Pamela, I think that you're right. I mean, it, it, the starting point is really understanding what it is feasible and what can be done, especially depending on the on the crisis situation. Uh, wh what's happening? Wh what has been happening in Mozambique as well? It has, uh, for example, using very basic technologies such, such as SMS, you know, uh, that uh, do not require uh, internet connection to uh, um, just you know rely on, on the basic infrastructure that is available to. Um, uh, to, 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 to ensure that uh, the needs of very remote populations are, are, are addressed and, and tackled. So, and as a way of connecting people also to share information about the specific crisis situation and, and keep on uh, 
for example, businesses ongoing uh, while uh, the, uh, uh, the situation is, is, is brought back eventually to, to, to normal after, after a crisis. Just, uh, just as a quick example. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if if anybody also has an addition on that. It's welcome. Um, maybe there's also a, spe a special question I would like to direct to Professor Ndemo, who also deals in entrepreneurship. Uh, Majina is saying that SMEs are resistant to current technology, virtual meetings, and so on. How can they change this situation? Maybe not automatically related to financial inclusion, but e-commerce, which indirectly relates to financial inclusion. Uh, that's, a, that's a generalization. Um, I know uh, SMEs are embracing uh, technology in a very heavy way. I, I gave earlier an example of a micro women entrepreneurs who, who fall within the micro enterprise. Uh, when they couldn't sell a thing, uh, they instantly embraced technology to reach their markets. They instantly began to use mobile money to get payment and the pay for their for the supplies that they got. They are actually involved in in this. They are the ones who borrow most from mobile platforms. So we if we say that they are not they are resistant to current technologies is not correct. Uh, some people may, may be, but not all MSMEs. One thing I must add as I conclude is that uh, as we deepen the use of mobile money or digital money, uh, we keep on seeing a lot of positives. Uh, in Kenya here, uh, our Red Cross Society uh, deployed blockchain in Northern Kenya where most of the refugees live. And uh, what they did is that uh, instead of government buying food and delivering it to, their, to those who are suffering because of drought, they sent the money directly and programmed the money such through blockchain that they can't use it for anything else other than food. It was very successful. The amount of resources that was used was much, much less than ordinarily it's spent when we respond to a crisis like that. So the more technologies we employ in the vulnerable people, uh, the better results that we get. And I hope we continue with this. Lastly, is about the MSMEs, that they are actually being disrupted now. Um, I am privy to the fact that uh, many of them are being recruited into platforms where they can access uh, lessons of marketing, where they can access digital um, learning and other things. Uh, so very soon you are going to see a lot more change with MSMEs and most likely they will begin to do better than they have done before. Thank you so much uh, on those insightful remarks. Uh, I totally agree with you that uh, actually some SMEs have tried to adapt to, to the current situation. And also to make note on the question of conflict uh, uh, and uh, fragile states, I would like to mention that this issue will be discussed further in detail in the forthcoming webinar, which will take place on June uh, 30th. Uh, right now, I'm taking this uh, moment to welcome concluding remarks from our speakers. It's been really, really uh, insightful uh, to hear from you, personal I've learned and new things, different projects taking place, and different methods that can really uh, boost financial inclusion for all in developing countries. Uh, I'll start with uh, Fiona. Any concluding remarks on one thing that you think should be a blessed to ensure that COVID-19 really works for well for boosting digital financial inclusion? Well, I, I, I mean, I'm, maybe I would like to put it more on the point around making sure uh, that digital financial services are inclusive, because I think, you know, the, we're seeing that COVID is stimulating positive change, but we can't assume that that will be inclusive. Um, and, and I think 
the other concluding point is is just reflecting back on the results. I started at the beginning about that. I sat in a room of women who were benefited from learn, uh, blended learning and use of DFS and micro and were growing their own businesses. The power of women is extraordinary. And one of the big learnings from AWEF is that um, give, give women more control over their financial situation, uh, the tools to do it, and amazing things can happen. So in response to COVID, give women the opportunity and the tools to be able to control their, uh, their finances, grow their businesses, and uh, we will see the, a, a revolution in terms of the growth of, of women-owned micro-businesses. And I don't just go for women, but more broadly with small businesses. Thank you so much. Women and small businesses should be really focused on building uh, the COVID-19 policy that are directed towards financial inclusion. Uh, Paula, uh, one more important aspect you think we should focus on going forward? Yes, thank yes. you so much. Well, first, let me say that I can't agree more with uh, with Fiona on, on the point that she raised. Uh, and then, I'll, I don't know if it is a new point, but actually I would go back to one of the first things we said at the beginning, that uh, indeed that uh, we all recognize and we all agree that digital financial inclusion uh, can play an important role in mitigating the economic and social impact of, of the COVID-19 crisis. However, this potential cannot be taken for granted uh, as the pandemic can accelerate pre-existing uh, risk of financial exclusion and even create uh, new, uh, new, new risk areas. So I think that uh, as the digital financial technology develops, as uh, digital financial services expands, um, questions related to inclusive growth, financial stability, also regulations, as it was mentioned by some of the speakers, need to be addressed at policy uh, making level in, in, in an holistic perspective. So not only tackling one of those of the dimensions, but looking at all, all the different dimensions of the uh, of the policy making cycle can come together uh, to, to, to really foster inclusiveness. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That's a, a very important point. And yes, we, without uh, without financial inclusion, most of the of, of of different regions remain excluded from the social economic activities. Uh, I totally agree with you on that, um, William. Yeah, I, I think I would go back to my response to the first question and this observation that the countries that, that fared the best in, in COVID-19 were those who had some of this enabling infrastructure, digital ID, payment systems already in pay, place and, and working well. Uh, and especially for those who, who struggled with things like social protection disbursements over the past year, and now that we're starting to come out of, of some of this, you know, now is the time to start thinking about preparation for the next crisis, whether that's another pandemic, whether that's, you know, a climate change related, whatever it's going to be. Um, you know, let, let's take the lessons from the past year and, and start, you know, building out those uh, systems. Thank you so much. Uh, you provide an important point about the already case examples that we should uh, look up to. And uh, for the interest of time, I'll move on quickly to Professor Ndemo. I, I, I think I summed up when I spoke last, and I, I would remain that way. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so <laughs> Thank you so much for, for being so brave. And I'll take this opportunity to thank all our participants. It's been very uh, a privilege hosting you and uh, work. Uh, I, I thank you for spending your time to listen in and to take part. Uh, those who asked questions, thank you so much. I take this opportunity to cross the webinar and I wish everybody a nice day, a nice evening, wherever they are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.